<laughs> yeah, it was going to be great to get your email. This is, it would be fun to do it. This uh, so, you know, talk about uh, this with a. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you could do that. Yeah, that'll be nice. Yeah, yeah. It's rarely that I talk to people who read something. Did you know? Right. Yeah, it's a terrific book, and I, I really love the um, previous. I haven't read, read your first. Oh, right, right, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, the Steel Drive Man, yeah, yeah. That one there, yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a very, uh, the, the connections are, are hard, you know. The, they're, I mean, they're both about big corporations, right? Uh, and they both have an autobiographical element. They do, that may yeah. be about the author more than the subject. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, and I'm going to be here at the dinner and then tomorrow and I don't know what's happening after the meeting. Okay. But I'm not. Okay. All right. We'll have to read Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I think we have to see where we're going. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I'm not going to be here person who, who uh, I, I lived here a couple of years ago, uh, and I was at the Newburgh, and uh, so um, the person who, who uh, had all, like, lived all together, here, I'll so, here. Oh, hi. 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 Nice to meet you. Um, I gotta go and put my stuff on. Yeah. All right. Here, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm
Well, what you what you to say is that right. Especially now when there's I don't think it's a huge place of my
crisis, not just in our own world. Um, today we focus on credit and trust with Scott Nelson, who's the legume, we don't know how we say it, legume, oh, legume. Le legume. 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 <laughs> professor of history at the College of William and Mary. Um, but before we start, I want to make a few announcements and talk about some upcoming programs here at the Institute. On February 28th, one of our dissertation fellows, Smita Das, who is a USC English graduate student, is going to lecture on um, From Cooley Convict to Indian Gangster, Styling Citizenship in Colonial Apartheid, South Africa. Um, our next crisis program will be on March 6th. The theme, as I said, is epidemics, and we'll host Priscilla Wald, who's a professor of English and Women's Studies at Duke University. Her talk is entitled Outbreak, Outbreak, Contagion, Sensation, and the Obscure Geography of Poverty. And there are two other events coming up this spring that I just want to let you know about. On April 4th, Eric Schlosser, who is the author of Fast Food Nation, will speak on food justice and American injustice. And on April 19th, Dibish Chakrabati, the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor of History, South Asian Languages, Civilizations, and the Law School at the University of Chicago, will speak on climate change and the historical imagination. Now, for those of you who are regular institute attendees, we will have a, well, for everyone, we'll have a reception after, but for those of you who usually come, instead of being over there, the reception will be back here right after the talk, and everyone is invited to um, stay and uh, enjoy some wine, some food, and some informal conversation. And now I'd like to introduce Leon Fink, a distinguished professor of history and UIC research of, researcher of the year in the humanities, um, to introduce Scott. <laughs> nice to have your publicity agent in high places. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad to be able to welcome uh, Scott, uh, uh, Scott Nelson to uh, UIC. Um, a little bit of background. Um, as uh, we all know, an advisor can play a key role in a student's life. <laughs> now, I first knew Scott as uh, an under, when he, he was an uh, honors undergraduate at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and he did his uh, honors essay as a senior on the panic of 1873. Uh, I thought it was a good piece of work, and that would be the last we would see of that topic uh, 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 for a long time, as far as I was concerned. Uh, Scott went on then to do graduate work in the Department of History at uh, UNC. Uh, and uh, he uh, approached me with an idea that he, of course, it was, a, it was a department that specialized in Southern history, but he came up with a, initially a, some research topic. He's interested in the, the, the Southern Railway um, ex slave laborers and their uh, conflicts with the Klan, uh, which uh, I thought would be a great article. Uh, and, but I, as I said, I really w wondered whether there would be um, sources for that for a larger project. Well, a few years later, he emerged with this uh, wonderful dissertation uh, and book, Iron Confederacies, uh, Southern Railways, Klan Violence, and Reconstruction. Uh, now, uh, he uh, then turned uh, and would regularly engage me about his projects. I'm not sure why, but his uh, <laughs> next project... He, 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 came, he told me that he was interested in writing a social history of John Henry. And I said, Scott, that would be great as a folklore or cultural studies project, but as a social history, your, your subject doesn't even exist. Uh, there's no uh, John Henry as a historical figure. And then, again, a few years later, Scott comes and says, well, I've discovered the real John Henry. Uh, and sure enough, uh, in The Steel Driving Man, John Henry, an untold story of an American legend. Scott uh, did the legwork uh, uh, to find this uh, prison laborer uh, for whom the whole legend was uh, circled. And it, it was a, the, the book itself was the winner of, among several prizes of the uh, Merle Curdy Award for the best book in US social and cultural history. 
uh, the, uh, there's a third book in there on the uh, Civil War, which uh, I had nothing to do with, so, but uh, again, uh, another prize-winning book. Uh, and then Scott uh, arrived at um, a project uh, beginning in 2006. Uh, he talked to me about that he was uh, interested, uh, after this prize-winning big, uh, this John Henry book, which really crossed lots of audiences, that he was returning to uh, an interest in the 1873, the Panic of 1873. I said, Scott, of all things, after you've just broken through, crossed all these barriers, uh, you're going back into the womb of your honors project and this obscure economic history in 2006. I mean, uh, really. Uh, uh, but, this, okay, so, okay, indulge yourself if you want. But uh, this, um, and then, um, then 2000s, uh, then we have the, of course, the Great Recession hits uh, the next year, and uh, uh, in, indeed it's a topic of great uh, interest. Scott came uh, a year or so later to the Newberry Library with a fellowship where we reconnected, and by this time his 1873 book had changed to, he was going to do um, sort of what we see, the beginnings of what we see now, uh, 1873 wasn't enough. He was going to do all panics and depressions in American history from the uh, American Revolution all the way to the, the Great Recession. And um, I said, uh, you know, Scott, you know, it's great to, uh, you know, to be ambitious, but, um, you know, you're never going to finish this before the end of the recession where we have, any, by the time you finish, nobody's going to be interested. And, and, and Scott said, well, according to his reading, these these panics last actually a long time. And, <laughs> um, sure enough, um, he's arrived with this book, which is uh, which is being uh, taken wide note of uh, in in uh, a, a very broad press once again. So uh, really, after taking stock of Scott's career, I just have one question. Finally, as a former advisor, to pose to him, Scott, what do you think I should work on? <laughs> so, with no further ado, Scott Nelson. Thanks, Leon. Uh, yeah, Leon is was a fantastic advisor. One of the things I remember most about Leon was. Um, when there were questions, it, it, with job talks, Leon would ask this question. He'd be among the first to ask the question. It would be complicated. And I think it was the German that he, that he learned in, in school and in, uh, undergrad. It would be compound complex sentences. All the verbs would be packed at the end. You would you'd have to re read it, listen to it very carefully to figure out what the question was. But it was like an origami hand grenade, the, the question, because people would start to unpack the question and then realize that he had kind of found the heart of their argument and with this devastating critique. And uh, so often, you know, if they were smart, they'd start to, to unpack it and they'd, they'd respond and then they'd think, oh, oh. Oh, I, I, yeah, so they're uh, watching the faces of people uh, from the questions for Leon. So I'm really looking forward to the question. <laughs> yes, for me about uh, this piece. Uh, so financial panic. Uh, the, this is a panic as, uh, as a volcano. Um, I, the, the way I came to this project is funny when I was initially going to do the Panic of 1873. Um, in July, let's see, in, in uh, August of 2008, I r posted this thing on Facebook to uh, about, I was struck by all the parallels between 1873 and 2008, a uh, very short piece, obviously, a Facebook posting. And a friend of mine who's a journalist said, everyone's talking about 1929, but no one's talking about 1873. And so she said, you should contact the Chronicle and write a piece for them. So I wrote a piece for the Chronicle of Higher Ed uh, about the similarities I saw between the Panic of 1873 and the 2008 uh, developing uh, banking crisis, and I said it was one that started in banking and then moved to the stock market that uh, started as a housing bubble and then a crash, and I, it did, uh, drew some parallels. And I, she sent it back, and she said, the, the editor, and she said, well, what, if, this is if this is like the Panic of 1873, and you persuaded me that this is some, what would happen? What's going to happen? So I predicted three or four things that might happen, and they all happened uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, so um, the piece started to circulate. I got a call from the Chronicle uh, saying that, that uh, it, it's um, very, very quickly become the most 
he, most, most hits of any piece ever published by the Chronicle. <laughs> uh, and people were circulating on these blogs, financial blogs, the, with the Nelson formula, which was, uh, and they said, well, what's the Nelson formula? You, you didn't mention that. In the, and what people had done is, I didn't realize that you could, uh, any publicly traded stock, you could, you could look at cash on hand. And I said that companies with low cash on hand would be in serious trouble, and co companies with high cash on hand would be uh, quite safe and, you know, if, if it's centrally a banking problem. And, um, and people were shorting low cash on hand stocks <laughs> and buying high cash on hand stocks in September of 08. And so people made actually millions of dollars, a bunch of fund managers made millions of dollars using this Nelson formula, which I confess I did not make a nickel uh, on, on this. Um, so that's, that's uh, I, I got, I guess it was September 3rd, I got a call from UBS and then from uh, BlackRock and then from all these other banks and funds asking me for the footnotes for this article that I wrote. Uh, where did you, you know, how do you get this thing about the money crunches and things like that? Where does this come from? And, um, and then they asked for, they said, well, what's, what's the book to read on all the history of all the financial panics, how they happened? Because some people say this is like 1837. And I thought there was a book like that, and there's Schumpeter's Crashes book, and there are a couple of others that function that way, but um, not uh, not d looking at it kind of through the mechanisms that I was looking at it. Uh, and so that's that's the book that uh, I decided to do. And so that's that's where this uh, book comes from. I'm not going to tell you the whole book, but I want to tell you kind of five things I learned as I wrote uh, this book. Uh, the first is. Um, that uh, the, the way in which, I, and, I, and I kind of understood that the Bank of the United States was one of these issues between the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party, but I didn't really realize how fundamental it was, really in the creation of the Democratic Republican Party uh, to begin with. That uh, it's, it's not just uh, that it's one of the issues alongside the Britain-France issue and you know, all the other things that we're used to thinking about with the, with the Democratic Republicans, uh, not just Hamilton versus Jefferson, but it really kind of goes to the heart of uh, this. Um, Jefferson, when he's asked about the charter of the First Bank of the United States, um, responds by making the first claim for strict construction of the Constitution, uh, arguing that the, the Constitution is a parsimonious document and that one should not go anywhere beyond it. Um, it's, it's, it it's, it's not the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions which happen later, it's the bank that becomes his first uh, place uh, for looking at this. I, I want to briefly talk about the Constitution and how we get this first bank of the United States uh, to give you a sense of this. One of the things I think that's important that I, I sort of didn't see at first but saw as I started writing, reading through the uh, newspapers is the role of um, the revolution itself and these continental uh, dollars that are issued by Congress uh, during the crisis, the revolution. And, and what, what happens is that Congress is issuing this currency um, but it's not really backed by anything. Cong the, the Continental Congress does not have uh, a kind of source of funding. And um, these uh, no Continental notes that are issued uh, quickly become almost valueless. Uh, the Continental Congress in the initial formation of the Articles of Confederation uh, has relatively little power, has no direct taxing power, and people recognize this. Uh, the other thing that happens is that the British um, Army figures out that the U.S. Is, is effectively doing this sort of deficit, this, this United States, as, as it's trying to, uh, to break free from Britain, is, is engaging in this sort of deficit spending. And so um, uh, British <coughs> generals start to um, uh, counterfeit these <laughs> continental dollars and issue that, you know, fighting financially. Uh, and so um, these Dollars become uh, almost valueless. The 40 for 1 Act passed in 1793 basically uh, says that uh, for every $40 in continental dollars, there's $1 in silver that the federal government will fully pay for this. And so uh, it's runaway inflation uh, that really hurts people who are obliged to hold currency, which turns out to be workers and other, uh, and other folks. There are um, kind of middling folks, the people who are, are speculating are uh, immediately jumping out of this currency, but other people who are holding it are hurt by it. And it's this anxiety, this anger about the continental um, currency that helps to make the case for the Constitution as the, as, um, the um, uh, kind of, uh, Federalist Papers are issued, um, the anti-Federalists kind of criticize them, the Federalist Papers return again and again to the failures of the continental 
dollar that this is. And, and so it's part of this reason that the federal government is not allowed to issue currency, and neither are the states. That, that this, this runaway inflation is a serious problem, and uh, it's an embarrassment. Congress needs a checkbook. The checkbook becomes Western lands. Western lands are handed over to Congress. Congress can then uh, pass out this Western land, um, and this will be the kind of source for uh, the new nation. Um, very shortly after, uh, the, what, what's unanswered uh, is a question of if there's got, not going to be, um, if, if the U.S. is not going to issue currency and the states aren't going to issue currency, who is? And the solution to that is one that's proposed by Alexander